For this episode, I wanted to talk about monsters and strange encounters with them. Well, in London, in 1837, this monster arrived from nowhere. In the dead of night, when he came leaping out in the dark, his eyes illuminated like hot red coals. His hands resplendent with glittering razor-sharp hooks. It was Victorian London, but soon he would be seen in other parts of the country, and he was most known for his seemingly supernatural ability to leap over high walls and make boundless, endless jumps of great distances. He could scale walls effortlessly, impossibly, and vanish back into the dead of night. He was mentioned by the Mayor of London, Sir Cowan, at a private meeting. Such was the growing concern over this mysterious figure. Sir Cowan read aloud a letter from a worried lady resident of London. The lady said she had heard of a wager being laid in which this trickster, a human, she believed, was being encouraged to frighten people in the manner as such. It appears, he read, that some individuals, of which the writer believes the highest ranks of life, have laid a wager with a mischievous and foolhardy companion that he does not take upon himself the task of visiting many of the villages near London in three different disguises, a ghost, a bear, and a devil. This unmanly villain has succeeded in depriving seven ladies of their senses, two of whom are never to recover. The affair has now been going on for some time, and strange to say, the papers are still silent on the subject. Well, at one house, the man rang the bell, and on the servant's coming to open the door, this worse-than-brute stood in no less dreadful figure than a spectre clad most perfectly. The consequence was that the poor girl immediately swooned, and has never from that moment been in her senses. The letter ends. So this would seem to have been a bet or a wager by a group of high-class pals to dress up as a ghost or a devil or a bear and scare the living daylights out of ordinary random citizens. And yet, if that is the case, how did his eyes glow so alarmingly red? And how was he able to scale impossible high walls and roofs to escape? How did he leap through the air? One young lady called Polly Adams a barmaid in a pub in London, was walking home from work late one night when she was brutally attacked in Blackheath Park. She said that after being assaulted, the villain escaped by making great giant leaps. Not long after this, another young lady was attacked. Mary Stevens, a servant who worked at a wealthy home in London, was assaulted on Barnes Common, another park in London. She also said that after her attacker had finished with her, he bounded away with seemingly impossible leaps. Jane Alsop was the next victim, who went to answer the doorbell of her home, when suddenly in the dark she found a hideous monster standing on her doorstep. The figure was cloaked in a long dark cloak, half out of the shadows. Glowing red eyes bore into hers, as the figure lunged for her and she let out a scream, alerting her sister and father. She described the figure later as having horns and claws, and it ripped at her neck and dress as she shrieked in pain. Her father and sister all confirmed that it then fled into the night, with extraordinary leaps into the air. His hands were icy cold, said the victim, but his eyes were like balls of fire. His face was hideous. He vomited flames. Well, the police put up a reward to capture the unstoppable assailant. Groups of vigilantes began roaming the parks and London streets in search of the offender. The Duke of Wellington and his aristocratic friends joined in, searching on horseback for the fiend and chasing any possible suspects. Yet he was never apprehended. Two years passed, with incidents reported of attacks on a regular basis, yet by now it had spread country-wide. In 1855, southern England began to suffer a spate of attacks. And here, the attacker left tracks in the snow, in fields and over rooftops, routes no man could have ventured to successfully, save without loss of life or serious injury. People began to call the tracks he left behind the footprints of the devil. The army were called in to attempt to capture him, yet they too failed to stop him. He taunted them appearing suddenly in their foxholes, where they hid to stalk him. 
then fleeing from the fox souls in the blink of an eye, leaping away into the distance too far and too fast for any soldier to chase him. Before he fled, however, he would slap a soldier swiftly across the face with a hand that was as cold as ice. At Aldershot Barracks, an hour from London, a sentry also received several ice-cold slaps to the face. Soldiers shot at the figure, but it had no effect. In Tinmouth, Devon, southern England, a Captain Finch was apprehended and convicted of charges of assault against two women, in which he was said to have been disguised in a coat of skin, which had the appearance of bullock's hide, a skull cap, horns, and a mask. However, another report then came in from Northamptonshire, north of London, which described the attacker as the very image of the devil himself, with horns and eyes of flame. It would seem that the legend of Spring-Heeled Jack remains an unsolved enigma, because attacks were happening all over the country at the same time. Well, just under a century earlier, the London monster was a big problem. First reports of the London monster appeared in 1788. This time, however, it would seem he was all too human, or it is believed. According to his victims, who were all ladies, a bulky male would follow lone women, shouting insults and obscenities at them, and then stab them in the buttocks. Some reported that he appeared to have knives fastened to his knees. At least 50 women reported being attacked. Some said he would offer them a nosegay to sniff, only for it to contain a sharp spike, which he would stab their face with. Many women ended up suffering quite severe wounds, as well as slashed clothes, dresses and underclothes. Women were not a little scared to venture, even short distances alone, and the men were infuriated that the Bow Street Runners, London's first official police force, could not catch him. Although there were only a handful of Bow Street Runners at the time, to cover the whole of London. As the attacks grew in number, a group of men, determined to put an end to it, came together to form the No Monster Club, and each wore a pin in their lapel to identify themselves as belonging to the No Monster Club, to ensure that when they were out in search of the assailant at night, they were not themselves accused of being him. A young man was accused of the crime, a florist called Renwick Williams, even though he had an alibi for many of the attacks. But with the hysteria of the time, he was arrested on the crime of defacing clothing, which apparently was a more heinous crime and a much harsher penalty than attempted murder. Well, he was sentenced to six years in prison, but many historians subsequently began to doubt his guilt. Well, we move on now to a different monster. In the frightening and dark days of the Nazi occupation of Czechoslovakia, a strange legend began to circulate of a creature as frightening as the SS henchmen themselves. The enigmatic and horrifying entity was given the name Perak, which translates a little like spring heeled Jack, but as the Spring Man. He was capable, it was said, of springing from rooftop to rooftop in the dead of night and under the light of the moon. The Perak would also linger in dark alleys, preparing to launch its assaults on the unsuspecting citizens of the city of Prague. He would wait in the shadows to jump out at factory workers, returning home from their forced working shifts, in the ammunition depots on the orders of the Germans. Not only could he jump the rooftops, but some citizens even said they watched as he leapt over buses and speeding trains, even blocks of apartments. And they said he could jump the wide traverse of the river Vitava, the Czech National River, which runs along the Bohemian Forest and then north through Prague. Reports said that he flew through the air like a shuttlecock, before vanishing into the darkness, with an inhuman shriek like a deafening shrill whistle. However, at the same time, graffiti depicting the Perak began to appear on walls around the city and he became a figure of resistance against the Nazi occupiers. People attributed the artwork to this phantom figure. Speculation began as to who or what the figure was. Some citizens said the Perak was a vigilante of Czech nationality, a local person, causing mayhem in defiance of the Gestapo regime, and indeed many later believed that he was nothing more than an urban legend, while others suggested he was an intelligence officer, 
or a paratrooper or spy from an allied country who brought chaos with him by scaring the workers from going to their munitions factory shifts, thus thwarting the Nazis' ability to manufacture their own weapons. Whichever the case, the Perak became a solid feature of Czech folklore and even comics as their very own superhero. Ethnographer Dr. Milos Pulek discovered that, in fact, this legend of a springing man dated back much further than Prague in World War II, tracing such legends to the 19th century when a hoax was perpetrated by Catholic vergers in northwestern Bohemia. Worried by an outbreak of atheism in local communities, vergers were said to have disguised themselves as leaping devils who leapt out at unsuspecting mining families there to scare the locals into renewing their faith in God and Catholicism out of sheer fright, according to Dr. Petri Janek of Charles University in Prague. He also describes that often the springing man would be confused with another supernatural figure called Razor Man, who, like Springing Man, would leap great lengths, widths and heights, but had the added horror of having razor blades attached to his hands. He would slash the face of unsuspecting citizens at night when he jumped out on them and then vanished again. In just one of the sightings of Springing Man, Milos Pulek quotes the memory of a boy who says, He jumped up and after each fall he went into a deeper squat to get a proper inflection. He jumped so high he had a head almost at the height of the tram's electric power at the highest point, every time the boots emitted a sound like throwing a brick in deep mud. In another testimony, a chase was witnessed by a Joseph spilling, and he says, in an absolutely sinister silence, the sound of the approaching train suddenly echoed, and when the first wagons began to pass, a black shadow emerged from somewhere. At that moment, the soldiers began to shoot fiercely from the machine guns. The black figure bounced off the ground jumped over the passing train, and then through a series of great jumps disappeared among the trees in the darkness of Ziskov Hill. Whether an enemy paratrooper, a phantom or a creature of the night, folklorist Dr. Milos Pulek points out that before he appeared in Czechoslovakia, stories about the Peraks, locally called Poprunki, also appeared in St. Petersburg, Russia, during the revolution of 1917, three decades earlier. So perhaps there is this creature, a monster after all. Well, to Wisconsin now in America, and on November the 10th, 1975, a Wisconsin couple had a very disturbing encounter on their front porch. Mr. and Mrs. E. of Wuatosa heard a knock on their front door that winter evening at around 7.50 p.m. Mr. E., who was called Peter, was a 65-year-old retired construction foreman, and he'd worked for the same local construction company for the past three decades prior to retiring. His wife Anne was 59. When the doorbell rang, she peered out of the front room window. She saw an oddly dressed man who appeared to be holding a long white staff. She went to the front door and opened the screen door and greeted him questioningly. She asked him what he wanted, but she received no reply. She asked again, but still he said nothing. That's when she called out for her husband to come to the front door. On seeing the man for himself, her husband declared, What's this? Something left from trick-or-treat? Curiosity getting the better of him, he reached for the front door and opened it. Later, the husband described the man in more detail. He said the skin on his face was the same as smoked meat, and his face was lined with deep grooves. He added that the odd-looking man had just a very small pucker for a mouth, with a tiny opening only about the size of a penny, and his chin was very pointed. The man was wearing a hat like a straw hat with a narrow brim. There were tufts of hair sticking out the sides of the hat. He looked like an oversized gnome, said Peter. He really thought it was someone playing a prank on him and his wife. So he went to grab hold of the man, but when he reached his arms forward, the man tapped his white staff hard on the ground and floated backwards, said Peter. He didn't step backwards or jump backwards, he just drifted away from me. As Peter glanced beyond the strange man, he could see four more figures looking straight at him. Two were on his lawn, and a further two stood in the road, all looking toward him silently. Peter said they were all dressed alike, and they all carried this white staff in their left hands. Their feet were making walking motions, but they were two or three inches above the ground. He added that these figures looked like they were deformed. Their hands looked arthritic all bent inwards like claws, and their legs were bowed. 
As they tapped their staffs down hard on the ground, they would glide and float above the ground. Peter likened it to when astronauts float in space, and when they jumped up and down on the moon landing, he believed that their staffs must wield energy to enable them to do this. He went back inside and called the police. Officer Daniel Anderson of the police department had just received a startlingly similar phone call about strange people just a few streets away. The police searched for the men with the white staffs, but by the time they got to Peter's house, the strange men had left and they could not be found in any of the nearby streets. Despite the police not really believing the elderly couple and the couple's own family scoffing at such silliness, Peter and his wife never changed their story. Peter said the whole thing took about two minutes. Why go to so much trouble for two minutes? And perhaps more to the point, he asks, and how could anyone get people to float over my lawn? In another strange account, from the Humcat Index of Ted Bloucher, comes the case of a Mr and Mrs Hector Davis, who were asleep in their camper on the night of 25th of August 1968, near Townsville, Queensland, Australia. Suddenly Mr Davis woke with a feeling of suspicion. Looking out of the window of the camper, he saw a small being about four and a half feet tall, sitting in the tree, approximately six feet off the ground. The being had long blonde hair and dazzlingly bright blue eyes, and he was wearing a one-piece suit of grey with matching gloves and shoes. He wore a kind of cap with an antenna, from which came a faint glow. Mr Davis jumped up, intending to go outside and take a closer look at the strange fellow sitting in the tree, staring at him. But just as he got up, still watching the tree, the figure in it floated from the tree as though, according to Mr Davis, it felt guilty it had been caught watching them sleep. The figure glided across the road, which was about 40 feet away. Its legs seemed to sway as if it were walking on the ground, yet it was moving mid-air. Then it glided away in the distance, too far to see, until it completely disappeared into the night. On the evening of November the 17th, 1974, a number of motorists observed something decidedly odd. The first motorist was Ernest Smith, who was driving alone along a quiet road on Bald Mountain in the state of Washington. In the beam of his headlights, he suddenly saw something so strange it makes no sense at all. He said it was the size of a horse, covered in scales and standing on four rubbery legs with suckers like octopus tentacles. The head, he said, was shaped like a football with an antenna sticking out of it. It gave off a green iridescent glow. Motorists Mr. and Mrs. Ramsbow also claimed that they too saw the same monster. Lewis County Sheriff William Wister had gone out to investigate the reports, but according to researcher Jim Brandon, he was shut down by the Air Force. He said heavily armed military with no insignia were soon seen in the area, leading their own search. Well, one misty night in the winter of 1974, 68-year-old Mr. William Bozak of Frederick, Wisconsin, had what he described as a hair-raising experience. He was driving carefully home in the fog after a farmer's meeting, back to his rural dairy farm, where he'd lived for over 30 years, when he suddenly saw a strange object on the roadside. As he drove closer to it, what he saw baffled his mind and defied any logical explanation. He would later tell the newspapers that he saw a human being standing inside a bullet-shaped transparent glass compartment. The figure inside the glass compartment was between 8 and 10 feet in height, and its arms were raised above its head. The man's ears were higher on his head than normal. Said the farmer, I was so scared I was afraid to go out at night for many days afterwards. He told reporters that the figure was wearing a tight-fitting suit, but had a furry upper body. He said, it was looking out of the glass. It was a different kind of character than you'd see on this earth. It looked a good deal like a man, but it had a different looking face. It had a kind of cow looking face. His ears were shaped like a cow's ears too. The being had no collar or shirt, but it did appear to be dressed. The farmer said when he stepped on the accelerator to get away, the inside of his car got dark and he heard a noise like the engine was missing. He also heard a soft whooshing sound, like tree branches rubbing up against the car. 
Investigator Everett Leitner reported that Mr. Buzzock was very frightened at the time, but added that according to the farmer, the creature's face looked as scared as his was. The farmer said he could tell this by its large eyes protruding from his head. Though the farmer was terrified, he also said later that he regretted leaving the figure. I should have stopped and tried to show it I was friendly, he said. I wish I could meet up with it again. I'm not sure I would say that. The newspaper account of it appeared in the St. Paul Pioneer Press, though the farmer kept it to himself for a month or so after. But he said, I'll take a lie detector test to prove this isn't just something I made up. Investigator Leitner found the farmer to be held in good regards by all who knew him in the farming community, and none had a bad word to say about him, leading the investigator to believe he was being sincere about his encounter. In November 1896, the Stockton Evening Mail of California published a very strange account from a Colonel, H.G. Shaw, who says that he was in a horse and carriage travelling along a country road near Lodi in San Joaquin County, California, with a friend named Mr. Camille Spooner, when they found themselves harassed by three tall, thin humanoids who attempted to kidnap the Colonel and his friend. The colonel said that fortunately they successfully managed to fend these strange humanoids off. The newspaper headline said three strange visitors who possibly came from the planet Mars seen on a country road by Colonel Shaw and companion. Of the colonel, the newspaper says the gentleman was very reticent about relating the circumstance as he said he believed nobody would believe and he was loath to appear in the public. The colonel says, Were it not for the fact that I was not alone when I witnessed the strange sight, I would never have mentioned it at all. The horse suddenly stopped and gave a snort of terror. We beheld three strange beings. They resembled humans in many respects, but still they were not like anything I had ever seen. We were startled, as you may readily imagine, and the first impulse was to drive on. However, the horse refused to budge. The group of beings, he said, were at least seven feet tall and extremely thin. In fact, the colonel estimated their weight to be less than one ounce, which is far less than a bag of sugar. The beings were communicating with each other with warbling sounds, he said, like a monotonous chant that was guttural. Their feet were long and narrow, and their toes were as long as their fingers. They wore no clothes, and their skin he described as like silk and soft as velvet. They had no hair, their ears were tiny, and their nose, he said, were like polished ivory. Their eyes were very large. Their mouths were tiny, and it seemed to me, he said, that they were without teeth. He said we concluded to get out of the buggy and investigate. I asked them where they were from. They seemed not to understand me. Their remarks were addressed to each other, warbling rather than talking. I saw it was no use to attempt conversation. They seemed to take great interest in ourselves. They scrutinised everything. Their feet were nearly twice as long as ordinary man. Their fingers were without nails. They were extraordinarily slender, and they were without any clothing. Their mouth was small and without teeth. That, among other things, led me to believe they neither ate nor drank, and that life was sustained by some sort of gas. Each had a bag under the left arm to which was attached a nozzle. Each being held to his hand something about the size of an egg. These substances emitted the most remarkable and penetrating light one can imagine. One of them came close to me. I reached out to touch him. It was soft as silk to the touch. Placing my hand under his elbow, I lifted him from the ground with scarce effort. I do not want you to get the idea these creatures were hideous. They were the contrary. They were possessed of a strange and indescribable beauty. They were graceful, divinely beautiful. Finally, they became tired of examining us, and then one of them, at a signal from one who appeared to be the leader, attempted to lift me, probably with the intention of carrying me away. But he could not move me, and finally the three of them tried it without success. They appeared to have no muscular power outside being able to move their own limbs. Well, the beings then flashed their lights, and resting in the air about twenty feet above the nearby river, the colonel noticed an immense airship. It was a 150 feet in length at least, and outside had a large rubber, but there was no visible machinery. The beings walked rapidly towards the ship. Not as you or I walk, he said, 
but with a swaying motion, their feet only touching the ground at intervals of about 15 feet. He said we followed as rapidly as possible, but with a spring they rose to the machine, a door opened, and they disappeared within. The airship went very rapidly through the air, and he said it expanded and contracted with a muscular motion, but was soon out of sight. The newspaper report adds that for more than a week the papers all over the coast have been reporting the presence of an alleged flying machine, which many reputable people claim to have seen on several occasions in the heavens at night. Can you really remember significant events? asks a man called David. Me too. I remember my first bicycle, my first day of first grade. I remember all kinds of firsts. That's why I can remember my first encounter. Happened in Monroe, Louisiana. We'd just moved there and I was about five. At the time, we were among the first few houses. If you stepped out of the sliding glass door in our den, you would be on the back porch, looking out at a large backyard. On the left, you would see a barbed wire fence. On the other side of that fence line was a forest of tall pine trees and oaks. Into the forest was a clearing. In that clearing was a pond where cattle would gather to drink. The property belonged to someone who raised cattle. The cattle were allowed to wander all over the land. Occasionally, you would see a doe in the forest. We were not allowed to go into the forest, which meant that my brother and sister and I immediately found a way to break that rule. We played there a lot, says David, and he was talking to Guy Malone and Joseph Jordan on the Alien Resistant Network site. David says, The next thing I know, I felt as if someone had shaken me awake. I heard something tell me that it was time to do my chores. I got out of bed, wondering why I was doing my chores in the night. I go up the hallway to the bathroom to get the first trash can. I carried it in the dark to the sliding glass door of the den. Because I was so small, usually either mum or dad would open it for me. But no one was up at that time of night. So I stared at the door wondering what to do. Suddenly, the thought came to me that I could just walk through the door, that I do not have to actually open the door. The idea fascinated me and thrilled me, so I did it. I took a step forward and began going right through the glass. I made it all the way through, except for the trash can. It wouldn't go through the door. I placed the can on the floor of the den and finished walking through the glass door. From this point, my memories are very sketchy. I'm on the porch looking at lights in the sky. My next memory is of being in the forest on the other side of the barbed wire fence line. I have no idea how I got there. I was just standing there. I got worried as I never went into the forest alone. I recall taking a few steps down a trail. I stood there by the oak trees looking into the woods. Now here comes the weird part. Standing just on the other side of the oak trees was a fawn. She poked her head through the foliage and told me not to be afraid. She had these beautiful, huge eyes. I felt as if I could fall into those eyes. When she looked at me, I felt as if there was no other existence than her eyes looking into my soul. She said she was very glad I came. I do not remember walking to the pond, but I remember standing next to the pond. All around the banks of the pond were animals of many sorts standing there with me. Then other children joined us. Then I go completely blank. I have absolutely no idea what happened, but I have scars on my knees. After I blanked out, my next memory is of sitting on my couch. My grandmother was holding me and I was crying, and I hurt all over. Both knees had puncture marks. The holes were bleeding. Today, I have two little circles where the holes were made. When I was in my twenties, I had to get a physical at Barksdale Air Force Base in Bozier City, Louisiana. The physician asked me when I'd had surgery on my knees. I told him I had never had any such procedure. He thought I was lying. There have been other events. My sister and I remember being taken for tests and the presence of military. The military were always present, it seems. There is a blue orb that has followed me most of my life. My ex-wife saw it. The first time we saw it, we were walking to her apartment. This blue light appeared about a hundred feet off the ground, and we watched it disappear. Then we realised an hour had passed. We found ourselves staring at the sky with our mouths hanging open. One night, we said our prayers and fell asleep. 
I was awakened at 3 a.m. to the sound of her screaming. What Cynthia was screaming at was a giant creature that looked as if it had come from a cheap B horror movie flick. It was standing at the foot of our bed. Its head looked as if it was a cobra's head. The guy standing next to him looked like a human leopard. They were telling me that I still belonged to them. These creatures are in league with certain elements of all governments. They want nothing short of the death of your soul, he said. 